All right, let's get started. Let's talk about some turning stuff. Um, okay, so I have this part here. It's from my uh, pen mechanism. Um, uh, I want to use this assembly. I want, I want to be able to pass this part to the subspindle. Um, what I want to do is what I refer to as a pick-pull part, um, which is basically the subspindle comes over. Um, here, let's actually let's do a little inception action here. I looked all over the place and I couldn't find a better uh, example of this operation than than what John Grimsville's got here. So I'll kind of talk this through this. He's doing some threading here, but the next operation up is what I'm talking about. Um, so you'll watch the subspindle is going to come in. Um, the he's doing it stop. There's really no ne no need for it to stop. Um, but the key here is subspindle comes in, grabs the part. Uh, spindle one loosen uh, the chuck opens. Spindle two pulls back by some distance. Um, the parting tool comes in, parts it off, and the parts returned um, back to the sub spindle or the, head, the second headstock home position. And then you continue machining from there. Um, this is the basis of how you work if you have a bar fed lathe um, where the bar is not being pushed on by the bar feeder. Um, so let's hop back into HSM Works, and and what I want to do is I want to basically uh, I don't want to define anything when I go to post. All I want to do is have two jobs that are set up, and when I click the post process button, have all of that spit out. And so I've got this part here; it's all programmed up, and this is sort of the uh, this is just for reference. It's uh, when this part's finished machining but ready to part off. This is basically what it will look like. It will be the combination of, of this part and all of those surfaces are machined and all of the milling work's done too. Um, but this is sort of what's left. And uh, I have, we'll, we'll switch to this both configuration, which is, that's the point where I want to come up and, and pick the part at. Um, and maybe I'll wind up changing this because it's obviously kind of gripping on a spot that's sort of springy. Um, and we might want to push this forward some, but just in theory, let's say that's where we want to pick it at. And um, let's go back to the spindle one configuration. And then in here I have sort of this other, uh, let's show this guy. That's sort of, that's the position that we can imagine that this part gets pulled to. Um, so sort of the, when the part off operation is actually happening, that's where we want uh, the part to be. Um, and so there's, uh, what I've isolated is that there's really only two relevant pieces of information in here, or two things that you need to feed the post processor in order for this to happen, or maybe three. Um, the first one is the distance that we want to pull. And I think I've, I, I've used this one before. Uh, when I had my Citizen Swiss, um, the first thing that I did was sort of conquer this problem, which is figure out how much to pull by and how to define that on the HSM works side so that when you post, we don't have to define anything and it just knows how far to feed the stock out on the next operation. And so the way that I did this is, uh, we'll just show this piece of stock here. We'll get rid of some of this, uh, oops, get rid of some of this for example stuff and just break down to the stuff that's sort of functional. Um, there we go. Okay, so that is if we come in here and we look at this job, those two things, we have the, the part and the stock. And that piece of stock is a, a virtual component and it's a solid body and it consists of a single extrude. Um, the sketch for it is on this very back face and it's being extruded um, in this direction by the width of my part off tool plus the stock that I plan to leave as cleanup, which I think is five thousandths on, on the subspindle side, on the back side. And then it's being extruded the other direction just by some arbitrary amount that's enough to cover uh, the front of the part and make sure that we have stock to face off and uh, to get a clean full part out of. Um, and this is kind of funny because usually I think people would define this as being some big arbitrary length piece of stock, um, but I think that that's really all that we need um, in order to get accurate toolpath out of as well. Because you're really not machining on anything past that point or there's not usually a lot of point to it. Um, and in some cases maybe you would if you want to put a chamfer on here to clearance for a tool to come in or something like that, a, you know, a milling tool. 
Um, but if you wanted to, I don't think that this would prohibit that from happening. Um, but so, so that, that length that you want to pull out is one of them. And then the other was one of the things that we need to automate and feed. Um, and I think that as long as we can figure out in the post processor how long this piece of stock is, which I know we can do, um, then that part's pretty easy to automate. Um, the other one is, and we'll sh show this here, is the position of this. And this one was a little bit harder and took me a little while. Um, and the reason it's harder is because I, or well, I asked a lot of people and they basically said, there's not any way to get the distance from this WCS to this WCS. Um, and that's basically what we need. And I gave some thought to it for a while and I came up with a solution and I thought, wow, this is great and this is going to work awesome. And we'll go through what that was in a second. I want to go through how or why we need that distance between the two. Um, but anyway, it turned out I was wrong and, and my method wasn't going to work and I totally got lucky with why we're now able to make it work. Um, so let's talk about why we need the distance between these two. Um, if you th With the way that this is set up, if we take a look at these uh, work coordinate systems, there's one that's on the face of this chuck and one that's on the face of this chuck. And that's how I run at the machine is uh, the coordinate systems are both just, I've located the face of the chuck and that's where I work from. Um, in here, the parts spaced out by some amount and I know how much I need to feed my piece of stock out by, um, and that's that. And then the, the crucial part here is at some point, then you take and you jog this subspindle over all the way up to the point where it uh, basically would touch, or actually exactly to where it would touch this face. And when you're doing that, you probably don't actually jog it all the way over, but you space it out by some gauge block amount. Like I think I did an, an inch off and just went until a one inch gauge block perfectly fit between those two surfaces. And then I stored that as an A, uh, which is the the axis that jogs the sub spindle towards the, the main spindle as an A axis offset. And so in theory, if I were to call up G54 A0, the sub spindle would feed all the way up until it perfectly contacted the face of the main spindle. And you really never want to do that, but because that is true, it also means that if I called up A plus uh, three inches, that it would be exactly three inches off of the face of this. And so once you have that, then you know that if you define these two things and you know that this part exists where it does relative to this and then you know that this is where you want it to be relative to this and say that that number is in this case we want 2.76 inches so then in my program what I need to do is when it's time to, to come in and pick this part off is I want it to come in to a 2.76 inches clamp unclamp the main spindle pull it by the stock length uh, that I have defined in there, and then reclamp the subspindle and part it off in its new position. So anyway, regardless of how we get that uh, the part off code sorted out, those are just the things that we need. We need to know uh, how far to pull and the distance between the two spindles or the desired distance between the two spindles. Um, and so what I've done is I've taken these two operations, uh, one from job one, one from job two, and I've posted those out using uh, dump.cps, which is a special post processor that basically just feeds, it's sort of the intermediate post. It's, it's all of the data from what you're posting out just sort of gets dumped into a file. And that's basically everything that the post has access to from the cam side of the software, everything that the post has access to when you post with dump.cps, it's in there. Um, and that's super, super useful as a post developer to just be able to see everything that you have available to you and uh, you know the correct name to call it and, and everything like that. Um, so that's that looks something like this. And if you uh, take a quick look at it, we've got, you know, this is uh, showing all of the details of the post. Um, you can see I posted out this turning face one operation uh, and here it is turning face one and if I scroll down you'll find literally every single parameter that's being posted out and then uh, a whole bunch of information about the tool like literally every every piece of thing or every piece of information that uh, the post would possibly need is being fed out to it and so what your post does is basically takes the information that it needs out of this and contextually 
kind of uses that or uh, conditionally uses that to generate your G code. Um, you can see here there, there's all of the actual uh, movement code and then we're jumping into uh, you know that section is ended right there and we're jumping into the second job and the second part and it has sort of all of the information that's relative to uh, to that operation now. Um, the bit that we're going to sort of use or exploit in here is right up near the top. Um, at least let's for now focus on getting the stock length because um, that's pretty important too. I mean, that's definitely one of the big pieces that we need. Um, calculator. Um, so, if you take a look at this section, what we've got is uh, looking at the op first operation from the first job, we have this section right here and it's spitting out a bunch of data. Um, the two we're concerned with here are stock lower Z and stock upper Z. And what these numbers are, they're uh, sort of just the extents of the stock from the coordinate system. They're the distance from this work coordinate system to the, the stock lower Z and the stock upper Z. And so if we take and compare those two numbers and we take the stock upper Z, which is basically 3.1, minus the stock lower Z, which is basically 2.38, we get 0 0.72. We'll just hop in here real quick and um, we'll show this guy here. Isolate that. We'll just, I just want to make sure that it's right. And we grab that and it's 0 0.72. So that's what we got. So if in our post processor, if we just do a math equation that's reading the stock upper Z minus the stock lower Z, uh, then we get our our distance to pull and our distance to offset our parting, parting operation by. Um, so that alone, that's like two out of the three things that we needed, right? Um, so now let's look at the second one. What we needed is uh, the distance from this point to this point. So let's take a look real quick and let's measure what that was. I think we maybe already did this. I think it's 2.76, um, 2.76 inches. Um, so we needed a way to figure that out. And the sort of epiphany that I had is that I asked a bunch of people, they told me we can't get the distance from there to there because uh, the post processor really doesn't know where the WCSs are in relation to each other. And I realized that's pretty true, but what we do have uh, is that section I was talking about and um, and we have one for the first job and we have one down here somewhere for the second job and so my thinking was well if I know the distance from here to say uh, the stock lower Z then we know the difference from here to the stock lower Z um, well that distance plus that distance tells me how far apart these are and I, I literally had this in the middle of the night and I thought, wow, I'm never going to tell anybody about this. I'm going to keep this to myself because this is uh, this is just going to automate this whole process and I'll just leave people in wonderment of how I did that and it's going to be awesome. And then I tried it out and it turns out that even that doesn't work and it's because uh, basically you're reading the variable in this job and then once you go to the next job, uh, basically this can't read that variable from the next job, which is ridiculous and stupid and it made me really upset because I can read basically from this this portion right here which is where I need this all to happen in the post processor I can read every single detail about this job except for the literally any of the parameters that I needed to to make this happen and I'm sort of glad that I got really frustrated because it actually caused me to want to track down whoever made it so that this isn't possible and I got I feel like I got really lucky because when I did that what I got told was, yeah, that doesn't work, but we just implemented something uh, that, and as long as you're on the most recent version of the software, uh, there's a different variable in there that will make this happen. And I forget exactly what it is. And to be honest, I haven't looked at exactly what it's reading, um, but there is this FCS origin. And I still have no, like I said, no idea what this number actually represents, but I do know that if I take this variable right here, and we go 1.61567, and this was this was that FCS origin from the second job, and we'll do this, find the same one from the first job, 
we go plus 1.14433. We add them together. The point is when you add those two numbers together, we get the distance between our two work coordinate systems. And that's all that we care about. And so now in our post processor, we literally have the two things that we cared about. And from there, eventually I will make this work so that we can fully automate this process. Um, and if anybody's interested, let me know and maybe I'll walk through that. I can't fathom that a video on actual post processor development will be interesting, but uh, the internet's full of surprises, so let me know. Um, while we're in here, I did want to cover a couple of cool things that I came across while doing this. Um, one is that if in our job, well, let's take a look at this is the first job we have defined is our spun profile of our model that came from Fusion. And it's spun and it has some delete face work on it. None of that's important. Um, and then it has the stock is defined as that solid body. And that's basically it. Not too much to see there. The cool thing is that in the second job, we basically just duplicate the exact same thing and we have the same part and solid stock. Uh, but then we check this continue machining from previous job. That's kind of the key because we know that when we're machining this, we're going to have a whole bunch of material that's removed. And basically all of this is going to be removed. I'm machining this thing back to the end of the stock um, and even going to part this off in, in the first operation. Um, and you can see other settings in here. We're picking up the second WCS. Uh, we're marking this as the second spindle. We're uh, using the second work offset, all of the fun stuff that you want to do. Um, but what's cool about that is that then when you come in here, you can see that it's seeing this whole stock, but all of these operations, um, you'll notice that, uh, let's look at this. This is the stock that actually remains as of the end of the first job. And it just has basically just this section and the front of the part uh, needs finished. Um, but this, again, the stock that we're defining in this job is the full stock. Um, but because this works really great in turning, all that this is machining, once you, you know, mark the rest machining operation in here, um, all that it's machining is the section that it needs to. Same deal here, it's only machining the section that it needs to. Um, which is a perfect example of something working just perfect right out of the bat and that it works so great that you are amazed that it works so great. Like it's something that, uh, to be honest, I expect to fail um, because it seems to fail more often than not when somebody tries to implement something like that. Um, but it was terrifically well implemented here, so I just have to sort of give the kudos. Um, second thing is you can see there's, there's uh, quite a few... Let's uh, let's go just to spin a one. I want to unlock my space mouse here. There's quite a few milling operations in here, and the thing I like to show is that um, this is just a, a job, and it happens to contain turning operations and milling operations, and but this job really doesn't have any idea of of how I'm machining these. The only important thing is that when you're machining it, you're setting it up. Or, or you're doing it in a way that your machine has the capabilities of doing it. Um, there's really only one way for this operation to work, and it's the post-processor's job to figure out how to align the tool into a position where it will work, and that's where the, the magic of middle turn in HSM works comes from. It's literally just, this is the exact same job that you'd use on a three-axis mill. Um, if, you, if your machine has five axis capabilities, you'd put those in here and again, it's just the post processor's job. It's not going to let you take it and put it onto a, you know, a five axis milling job onto an, uh, you know, a Haas ST10 or whatever. Uh, that machine's not capable of doing it, but it's the post processor's job to figure out that the machine's not capable of doing it and isolate it. Um, it's kind of a neat way of working and uh, uh, Anyway, just makes things simple. You're, you're just using a very consistent environment to make things happen. Um, I think we've been going for long enough. Let's, let's call it good there and uh, have a good night.